Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for ALS Webinar Wednesday series. My name is Alejandra Herrera, and I'm the Marketing Coordinator for ALS North America. I will be facilitating the webinar today. If you're having technical issues with your webinar platform or you have any questions, please use the chat function. Thank you for joining us today for ALS Webinar. If you're having technical issues with our webinar platform or you have any questions, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. You can also select the hand icon to notify me of your status so I can assist you. All questions regarding the webinar material will be answered at the end of the presentation. Our presenter today is Tammy Chartran. Tammy is a business development representative for ALS Canada in the Ottawa area. She has over five years of client-facing experience supporting environmental projects and more recently specialized in PFAS testing. Tammy holds a Bachelor's of Science in Biology from the University of Ottawa and has been working in the environmental industry for over 10 years. Today, Tammy will be discussing an introduction to PFAS and PFAS testing options. Tammy, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Alejandra, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, so today I'm gonna to be talking about PFAS and PFAS testing options, uh, a pretty hot topic in our industry right now. So just a quick outline of what I'm gonna be going through. So we'll start off going through uh, some brief chemistry on PFAS. Uh, I'll go through the properties and uses of these compounds the different sources and exposure concerns. Uh, I'll go through the Canadian regulations and guidelines. Then I'll go through the PFAS analysis options, followed by sampling requirements, and then quickly touch on PFAS in air. So what exactly is PFAS? PFAS is a group of man-made chemicals that is characterized by a carbon chain with fluorine attached to the carbon. The term PFAS actually includes both perfluorinated and polyfluorinated compounds. For perfluorinated compounds, it's referring to compounds where all the carbons are saturated with fluorine atoms. For polyfluorinated compounds, uh, not all the carbons are uh, fully fluorinated or have a fluorine attached to them. There are thousands of different compounds that are considered PFAS chemicals. PFOS or PFOS and PFOA, PFOA are, are the most studied and have received the most attention over the years. Because there are thousands of compounds that are considered PFAS, uh, it does include more complex molecules and many of these are not actually measured by standard analysis at uh, commercial laboratories. Generally, they're targeting around 30 compounds. PFAS precursors are actually released into the environment along with the targeted compounds that we can test for. This pool of PFAS precursors is sometimes referred to as PFAS dark matter. The precursors can actually transform over time through biological and environmental processes uh, to endpoint PFAS, perfluoroalkyl acids. So these compounds do not degrade any further. Uh, PFOS and PFOA are examples of these endpoint products that don't break down. Because we are targeting and analyzing only a select number of the compounds, we could actually be greatly underestimating the total PFAS pool and the potential for PFAS concentrations to actually increase over time. This is just a quick overview of the timeline uh, around PFAS. So, Production of PFOS started in the 1940s uh, and then was eventually phased out in 2000. In 2008, Canada prohibited PFOS and related substances, PFOA and long chain PFCAs with some exceptions. Uh, and then we jumped more recently when the drinking water guidelines for PFOS and PFOA uh, were published in 2018 for Canada. So once these more common compounds, PFOS and PFOA, were being phased out uh, and facing further restrictions, manufacturing started looking for alternatives. So manufacturing shifted to short chain PFAS, 
uh, due to the fact they are believed to be eliminated more quickly and have lower potential for bioaccumulation. So these are considered uh, short chain for PFCAs, uh, less than eight carbons, and PFSAs, less than six carbons. Further, they reformulated the longer chain compounds with replacement technologies such as GenX, uh, which is the replacement for PFOA in manufacturing floral polymers such as Teflon. The question is, of course, are these really any better? These alternatives may or may not be less hazardous than uh, the original compounds PFOS and PFOA, uh, given that they have similar properties. There, of course, is very limited research and toxicity data out there for these alternatives. So the carbon fluorine bond provides really good stability, stability rather for these compounds under heat and chemical stress. Uh, because of their dual hydrophobic and hydrophilic characteristics, PFAS compounds have been widely used to make consumer products more stain resistant, waterproof, and non-stick. The most prevalent application, of course, is in the use of AFFF or aqueous film forming foams for firefighting purposes. But it is also used in common household items uh, in the oil, oil and water resistant finishes, paper, fabrics, carpeting, cookware, and it can even be found in cosmetics, clothing, and food packaging. Additionally, it is used in industry for electroplating, manufacturing, and aerospace and electronic applications. So where can PFAS be found? Uh, at this point, it is pretty much everywhere. Uh, however, these compounds are increasingly being found around military sites, airports, firefighting training facilities, in the runoff from fire incidents, landfills, and production facilities. So the direct sources are coming from manufacturing waste spills and use of AFFF and then indirectly from use of household and packaging products. So these compounds are surfactants and are very soluble in water. Uh, they find their way into the environment and a particular concern into our drinking water supplies. Uh, so they find their way into the water from industrial discharge, wastewater treatment plant, uh, treated sludge land applications and through long range air dispersion. Most exposure to PFAS is from the intake of contaminated food and drinking water. Consumer products are a pretty minor portion of the exposure pathway. So these compounds are stable, persistent, and bioaccumulative, and they are found pretty much everywhere in soil, groundwater, and air. Uh, the compounds generally have low volatility. However, they can travel great distances bound to particulate. So what is interesting is that we're actually, we actually see PFAS uh, being found in extreme northern environments at high levels in the serum of polar bears. Uh, and, and these locations are, are very far from the more common sources of PFAS. This suggests that airborne PFAS from production facilities can travel some distance in the atmosphere uh, along with ocean currents and up the food chain as well. Uh, just further proof of how stable and persistent they are. The biggest concern for human health is for long-term exposure by way of consumption. So uh, ingesting contaminated water and then also through our food sources. Uh, they are not biotransformed or metabolized within the body. Research uh, has suggested a number of different health concerns that uh, have been linked to long-term exposure. Uh, so uh, health risks such as thyroid disease, high cholesterol, uh, cancer, pregnancy-induced hypertension, low infant birth rate, and li liver damage. Uh, most of the current toxicity research is primarily focused on PFOS, uh, so a lot more research is needed to be done to look at the toxicity of these alternative chemistries that are being introduced. So this map just shows you uh, an overview of some of the hotspots that we find uh, in Canada. And you look, if you look at the list of these hotspots, most are actually associated with airports or Canadian force bases where AFFF has been used. So 
So now I'm going to jump into the regulatory mm -hmm. side. Um, I'm going to be focusing more on the Canadian uh, regulations and guidelines, just because that's where our lab is primarily focused on. Uh, federally, Health Canada released guidelines for Canadian drinking water quality for both PFOS and PFOA in 2018. Uh, and this actually also included a mixture guidance when the two compounds are found together. Further to the, these guidelines, Health Canada also released screening values for nine additional PFAS compounds in drinking water. And finally, they also released soil screening values for the same 11 compounds. So these are provided as guidance and can be applied to soils in which humans may be exposed. The federal environmental quality guidelines uh, were developed to allow for monitoring for PFOS in the environment uh, in the absence of Canadian environmental quality guidelines. So PFOS guidelines uh, seen here were published for surface water, fish tissue, wildlife diet, and bird eggs. Guidelines for PFOS in soil and groundwater for the protection of environmental and human health are currently being developed by the CCME and are expected to be published uh, sometime this year. At the provincial level, BC is actually the only province with any standards in place. So PFOS, PFOA, and PFBA are regulated in water, and PFOS and PFBS are regulated in soil under the contaminated sites regulation. In Ontario, the MECP did provide some guidance values for assessing uh, the potable groundwater pathway, and they are recommending using a value of 70 nanograms per liter to compare the summed concentrations of 11 PFAS parameters. Uh, and interesting to note that these are not the same 11 PFAS parameters found in the Health Canada guidelines. In the US, many states have issued or proposed drinking water standards. Uh, mostly focusing on PFOS and PFOA, and some states are, are actually proposing additional PFAS compounds, um, particular uh, North Carolinas, including Gen X. Um, my colleague Ron Montino gave a presentation a few weeks ago, uh, which covers more details on the federal EPA guidelines and recent updates. So that presentation can be found on our YouTube channel if you want to uh, take a look at that for more information on the US regulatory status. Australia has been leading the charge when it comes to all things PFAS. So they have a national framework for responding to PFAS contamination, which came into effect in uh, 2018. So this framework consolidates various guidelines and fact sheets, uh, which have set health and environmental guidance levels for investigating PFAS in soil and water. And it also provides a structured framework for how they will respond to managing historical PFAS contam contamination and incidents involving release of PFAS. So the ALS location in Waterloo is our national PFAS laboratory for Canada. Uh, we do have an additional six locations globally, uh, which are all supported by over 20 years of PFAS experience out of our Australian locations. So in the US, we have Kelso, Holland, and Houston performing this analysis. Um, our, our Waterloo Lab is fully accredited by CALA uh, to 17025 standards and accredited for soil, water, serum, and tissue. Uh, and we also hold the Department of Defense licensing and Ontario drinking water licensing. Sorry, I skipped over a slide there. Uh, so this is our current compound list. Uh, right now we're, we're running 32 compounds and this is consistent across uh, the ALS labs. Uh, however, in the water lab, uh, validation is underway to expand this list further to 50 compounds. So the additional compounds shown in green are, are in the process of being added to our, our targeted suite. Initially, labs and regulators have kind of focused on, on PFAS with longer chains uh, due to their persistence and ability to accumulate in organisms. But as we continue to add new compounds, we are also looking at the short chain PFAS as well as precursors and replacement compounds. 
So these new compounds being validated are in support of a new EPA method that's being developed. Uh, and this is based on a list of 40 compounds and expected to be published sometime this year. So for analysis, you have a few different options. The first option is the standard analysis by LCMS. So this is the most commonly used and, and the most consistent uh, for, for any kind of regulatory purposes. For water samples, you do have two options. Uh, we offer standard reporting limits and then low level reporting limits. So the standard reporting limits is done by direct injection LCMS. And then the low level analysis has a solid phase extraction pre-concentration step prior to analysis by LCMS. Uh, one thing I will note is that the standard level reporting limits do meet all current guidelines and screening values uh, for Canada. These are all fully accredited and validated methods based on EPA methods. So we have our method here for soil, serum, and tissue as well. Depending on your site and your requirements, we do have different packages uh, available to meet your needs. So uh, if you're looking for the full suite of compounds, whether it be standard level or low level, uh, we can also offer the Health Canada screening value uh, package, or if you're just looking for the BC contaminated sites package of those three compounds, uh, as well as the MECP guidance value sum. So the second analytical option is the total oxidizable precursor assay, uh, sometimes referred to as the top assay. As I mentioned, there are believed to be thousands of compounds that are considered to be PFAS chemicals, and most commercial labs are only analyzing between 30 to 50 of these compounds. So in order to get a better picture of the total PFAS pool, uh, this method was developed by House and Sedlak uh, in 2012. So the idea behind it is to, to model or predict how some of these larger PFAS precursor compounds will actually behave uh, in the environment, but at a more accelerated lab, lab scale approach. With this method, you will actually get two data sets, uh, pre and post oxidization. So uh, the sample is analyzed once we receive it uh, as is, then the sample is oxidized to transform any of the precursor compounds present into the PFAS end products and then analyzed again. So the difference in these data sets will actually give you an idea of the total PFAS pool within your sample. Important to note that the top assay can only be done using the full suite of PFAS compounds. Uh, so it can't be uh, applied to any of the condensed packages. For water, you do have the option to do the standard level or the low level for the top assay. For the analysis, we do use a single sample that is analyzed pre and post oxidization. Uh, so the idea is to avoid using a duplicate to limit sa sample variability between the sample and the duplicate. The graph on the right here just shows an example of uh, the top assay being performed on an AFFF product. So on the left is pre-oxidization and on the right, uh, post-oxidization. So you can see uh, the significant jump in concentrations. For sampling requirements uh, for water, you have two 60 milliliter HDB bottles without any preservative, uh, important that you're ensuring no Teflon liner is being used. Uh, for regulated drinking water, it is a 250 milliliter bottle uh, preserved uh, with sodium thiol sulfate. And they, they do this analysis by whole bottle analysis. The hold time is 28 days for both soil and water. So this gives, gives us lots of time to get the sample to the lab from across the country or from more remote locations. Uh, and then for turnaround, um, five days for your standard analysis, seven days for the low level, and then 14 days for the top assay. Uh, again, because we have to conduct the analysis twice for the top assay. It is important to use a PFAS-free water uh, so that can be supplied from, from your laboratory uh, when you're in order to do your uh, duplicates and, and any uh, decontamination. 
really important to use a strict sampling protocol and QA program. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So recently, there's been a third analytical approach that's been introduced to estimate PFAS um, using total organofluorine, or sometimes abbreviated to TOF assay. Basically, it's a simple way of estimating the total mass of PFAS in the environment by reporting the concentration of organic fluorine in the sample. Uh, so organic forms of fluorine are isolated in your, from your sample, then combust combusted at really high temperature, uh, which turns the organofluorine that is bound to the carbons into hydrogen fluoride. Uh, the hydrogen fluorine, fluorine then dissociate in a trapping solution, and then we have a concentration of fluoride ions in water that we, we can then analyze by ion chromatography. Important to note that this will give you the total mass of fluorine, not the total mass of PFAS. So because fluorine only represents about 65% of the total PFAS mass, uh, you do have to multiply this concentration by about one and a half times to estimate the total PFAS content of a sample. Of course, the major limitation of this method is that you, you're not going to get any information about which particular PFAS compounds are present, uh, but it will give you an idea of the total potential PFAS concentration based on the amount of fluorine. Sampling requirements are similar to that of the standard analysis, uh, and you're looking at about 10 day turnaround time. So there are uses and limitations for all the different options that we have available. Uh, the standard analysis is really useful for providing quantitative data for targets and primarily for regulatory purposes. However, it is limited to the target compounds. And of course, you're not getting a, a very good idea of the total PFAS pool present in, in your sample. The top assay gives you an idea of the levels of precursor compounds present outside of the target list. However, results are not fully quantitative, and we are still limited to those target co compounds post-oxidization. Further, further to that, not all PFAS being produced from the top assay will necessarily be coming from the precursors that are monitored. Uh, and there could also be other target PFAS outside of what are being monitored. Of course, one of the biggest deterrents uh, for, for the top assay is the cost. So because you're doing the analysis twice, it, it is double the price of the standard analysis. Finally, uh, TOF is helpful to be used as a measure of a total PFAS and can be used as a screening tool for high impact zones. Uh, it can also be, be used as a way to confirm if a sample is in fact PFAS free um, and also is the lowest cost of all the the, these three options. Uh, however, at the same time, the limits are higher than the standard analysis by LCMS, uh, and the analysis is not selective for PFAS compounds. So a combination of the three options might be the best approach uh, and most appropriate to provide a well-rounded understanding of the PFAS content of a sample. So this graph just shows the relative proportions of uh, TOF, TOP, and PFAS uh, standard analysis in three commercial AFFF products. So 3M Light Water uh, is a PFAS-based product that was phased out in 2002. And then the other two AFFF products shown represent more recently produced short-chain uh, fluorotelmer surfactants. The US EPA recognizes both TOP and TOF analysis uh, as important emerging techniques for non-targeted total PFAS analysis. It's a, it's a great way to provide multiple lines of evidence for informed risk assessments. So when you're sampling, because these compounds are so, so ubiquitous in the environment, uh, it's really important that you use a, a precautionary but common sense approach for your sampling programs. Uh, so this is by no means an extensive list of, of things to avoid uh, when sampling, but it, it gives you a good idea of some of the more common things. Uh, and because we're looking at such low detection limits, it's really important to ex limit exposure to any potential sources of contamination. So some of the more common things to avoid, of course, you want to avoid anything Teflon, uh, whether it be in your pumping, 
uh, your pump or tubing uh, or in your sample bottles themselves. Um, avoiding Decon 90, uh, instead use Alkanox, Liquinox, or Citronox. Uh, avoid LDPE or glass sample containers. So LDPE and uh, glass especially, uh, they have a tendency for, for PFAS to actually stick to the, the surface. A chemical blue ice pack. So this is uh, something that is commonly used to cool samples in, uh, in transport. So we wanna avoid chemical blue ice packs instead using free ice. Uh, and then you wanna avoid any kind of waterproof or plastic field books, uh, water resistant gloves or clothing, uh, and then cosmetics, creams, sunscreens, and related products. Transport Canada has a really good field sampling guide that you released uh, back in 2016, and it's a really great resource for sampling, sampling protocols, and they do have a section in there on QA, QC procedures. Another topic of interest lately has been PFAS and air. Uh, so PFAS and air from stationary sources, uh, these would include hazardous waste incinerators, thermal oxidizers, thermal desorb desorbers, and chemical plants and process vents. Uh, PFAS compounds themselves are generally have low volatility, uh, but they have been shown that they can attach to water droplets in particulate in the air and be dispersed long distances. So our lab in Burlington actually specializes in air toxics, stack, stack testing and special chemistries. Uh, and they have recently worked with our lab in Waterloo to develop a method for testing for PFAS compounds in stack emission uh, using XAV-2 resin tubes. So if you do want any more information on this, please uh, let me know and we can put you in touch with uh, Ron McLeod, our uh, special chemi chemistries director from Burlington. So just to conclude, uh, PFAS is very stable, persistent, bioaccumulative, and extremely mobile. There's still lots of research and guidance that is needed. Uh, so further toxicity data, uh, more information on the replacement compounds, and uh, further regulatory guidance. For analysis, your options are the standard LCMS, uh, the top assay, top assay, as well as air stack testing. Very important to have a strict sampling protocol in place and a QA program uh, so you can avoid any potential PFAS contamination uh, when you're sampling and, it, and ensuring your QA QC compliance. Some additional great resources for information. We have a number of EnviroMails uh, covering different topics within uh, PFAS. Um, as I mentioned, the Transport Canada Field Sampling Guide. And the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council has some really great uh, technical fact sheets if you ever want more detail there. Uh, and for if you're looking for something that's a little bit more uh, on the drama side of things, there are a few uh, movies and uh, documentaries out there. So uh, The Devil We Know on Netflix and, and Dark Waters um, is a, a kind of a Hollywood dramatization, both surrounding the events uh, at the DuPont plant in West Virginia. And that brings me to the end. Uh, if we have any questions, we can go to that. Thank you, Tammy, for your expertise and for your great content. Before we begin the Q&A, I would like to ask everyone to take two minutes to complete our survey the link is in the chat section. We would love to hear your feedback.
We will open the form. We will open the form for questions now. Please write out your questions using the Q and A function in the toolbar at the bottom of this webinar. I will give everybody a few moments to type in your questions. In the meantime, I'll review some brief notes. This webinar presentation has been recorded. All participants of this webinar will receive a follow-up email once the recording is available to view. We also post our webinars on our ALS Global website and our ALS YouTube channel in the webinar playlist. Also, please follow our company page on LinkedIn as we post announcements and registration links to future webinars and other resources and updates. We're so happy everybody's here today. If we're not able to answer your questions, please reach out to us later for assistance. Okay, our first question coming in, it's from Marty. He's asking, que, uh, oh, he just wants the presentation slides. Yes, we can provide that to you, Marty. Amy would like to know, do all the pre precursors subsidize to produce PFAS or are there only select precursors that will oxidize with this process? Is it similar to the results you might obtain using a total organic fluorine method? So for the, the top assay, uh, it is of course limited to compounds that are, are oxidizable. So yes, there is limitations there. Um, and it is also um, limited to oxidation products with, with shorter carbon chains and, and longer carbon chains uh, outside of the targeted PFAS. Uh, so it, it definitely has some limitations there as with regards to what compounds are available to be oxidized. And then of course, it's still limited to the, the targeted compounds. So if for instance, there are precursors present um, they could actually be transforming to, to other PFAS that we aren't testing for. So therefore, we, we might not uh, be accounting for those types of compounds, um, whereas that would, where, would be where TOF might come in and give you an idea of, of the total amount of PFAS. But then again, the TOF will only give you the, the total amount. So you have your, you have no indication of what precursors are contributing to that concentration. I hope that answers. Thank you, Tammy. Tim would like to know, is it assumed that the TOF, TOF result consists of only PFAS are there naturally occurring sources of fluorine that could bias high a TOF concentration in soil, example, organic materials? Yes, exactly. So for the TOF, uh, it, is, it is restricted to organic fluorine, uh, but not selective for PFAS specifically. So um, if there is some level of uh, other, other forms of organic fluorine present in the sample, it would be contributing to the, the concentration of fluorine that you would get from this analysis. Um, so it, it might be worthwhile looking at uh, fluorine, inorganic forms of fluorine uh, in your sample beforehand, um, just to get an idea, but exactly, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't account for just fluorine being contributed from PFAS. Annie would like to know, one of the labs that she used suggested freezing samples before shipping. Do you recommend this? Uh, we usually suggest shipping on ice uh, to keep the, the samples uh, between zero and six degrees, kind of the, the standard uh, sampling practice. Um, with the temperature there, I, I don't think that there would be a major issue if, if you are to to freeze it, I don't see that affecting the results, uh, but we do recommend just be keeping it between the, the temperature of zero and six degrees. Mm -hmm. 
April is asking, is the water analysis for drinking water only or drinking water, surface water, and wastewater? So the water analysis we are offering uh, is for any forms of water. So it's a modified uh, EPA method for, for drinking water, surface water, groundwater, any, any form of water, it can be applied. Mike would like to know, what is the oxidation process for samples using TOP? Uh, so for the top assay, um, it's basically they heat the sample um, with per, per sulfate and sodium hydroxide. Uh, so it generates hydroxyl radicals uh, and those radicals react with the PFAS precursors and break them down into the, the compounds that we test for. Do we have any more questions, anyone? Tariff, you will receive a follow-up email with the recording as well as a PDF uh, of the presentation. Well, it looks like that's all. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for attending this webinar today. And I hope everybody enjoys the rest of your week. Thanks, everyone.